Forget frequently asked questions. Common sense. Common knowledge. Or Google. How about advice from a real genius? 95% of people in any profession are good enough to be qualified and licensed. 5% go above and beyond. They become very good at what they do. But only 0.1% a real geniuses. Richard Jacobs has made it his life's mission to find them for you. He hunts down and interviews geniuses in every field. Sleep science, cancer, stem cells, ketogenic diets, and more. Here come the geniuses. This is the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Finding Genius Podcast. Uh, my guest today is Teresa Carvalho. Uh, she's a senior lecturer in physiology, anatomy, and microbiology at La Trobe University in Australia. We're going to talk about host parasite interactions, uh, specifically in regards to malaria. So, Teresa, thanks for coming. Hi, Richard. It's great to be here. Yeah. Well, um, for people that don't know malaria, from what I know, you know, you get bitten by a mosquito, and then the mosquito, I guess, uh, releases a bacteria into you through its salivary glands, uh, or is it a bacteria or is it a parasite? Like what, what happens when you get bitten by a mosquito that, that carries malaria? That's true, actually. It, it is a disease that is transmitted by a mosquito. We call that a vector-borne disease. Um, and in fact, it is a parasite, what the mosquito transmits. So as often with these kind of diseases, it's a very specific mosquito that carries the malaria parasite. It's Anopheles. And only the females transmit. Um, and like you said, when they bite a person, they actually, what they're doing is that they just they really need your blood um, in order to, um, you know, to have a meal. But while they're doing that, the um, parasite is in their salivary glands. So it takes this opportunistic time to be injected into the... After doing that, parasites, actually the malaria parasites, they, they migrate through the blood and they go to the liver. This is what we call the asymptomatic phase. So you might be infected, but you actually don't know that you are infected because you have no symptoms. Um, you are not sick. Um, but about... 10 days later, after you've been bitten, you start to develop maybe some symptoms and the symptoms, um, most often they look like a cold. Um, you know, you, you have a bit of a runny nose, you might have some headaches. Um, there's a, a bit of a wide range, but you feel generally not too bad. Um, and that's actually often one of the problems with malaria is that the first symptoms, they are not very specific. And so you might not take very uh, much notice of it. And the reason why that happens is, or the symptoms actually happen when the parasite decides to move from the liver and then we'll move into your red blood cells and it will stay into your blood. Um, so because it gets into your red cells, it destroys the red cells and you start to have some fever. Um, so it's important actually to um, treat those symptoms as early as possible, to diagnose as early as possible. So we can possibly treat people that are sick if we have um, treatments available and, and try and get on top of the disease. And it's often when people don't get treatment early enough that then malaria can progress to very severe disease. So then we talk about cerebral malaria, where the, the infected red blood cells, they can go to the brain and that causes obstruction of the capillaries in the brain and, and you know, that might lead into coma. Um, but we also talk about severe anemia because this parasite destroys so much your red cells that you will become anemic. Um, and this often happens in, in, in young children. So um, that's the main population that actually dies from malaria today are children under the age of five. So what is the malaria parasite itself is it a bacteria is it a it's a par know, it's, it's, it's a parasite and and so parasites are a little bit of a interesting organisms um the the broad definition of a parasite i guess you could think of as an organism that lives depending on another you know and that's that's a word that we might use on our on our jargon if you think of a person who lives at the dependence of another well in science we we say that th these organisms are parasites and i guess in the broad sense you could think that virus and bacteria are also parasites because, you know, they, they, they live inside our bodies, they need our bodies. So we call our bodies a, a host where, where the pathogen lives in. Um, but in science, we don't consider virus and bacteria in the strict sense of a parasite. So parasites are, are a different class of organisms and they, they are of enormous variety. We can find parasites everywhere. Um, and, and there's a bit more of strict definitions about it, the type of cells that they are, the type of organisms they live in. But really the, the main sense is that they cannot survive by themselves. So they, leave, they need an organism. So in the case of the malaria parasite, they, leave, they need to live inside the human body. And then to be able to continue developing, they need to be uptaken by a mosquito again. And so they, they can only live either inside the human person or inside the, or inside the mosquito, sorry. And, and that's really the biggest definition of parasites. 
Um, so they have they multi. They, is it a multicellular creature? Like, what is the parasite like? Yes, most of the time they're actually um, so what we call the eukaryotes. So um, they are a little bit more developed than bacteria. Bacteria are prokaryotes, so that means that they don't have a compartmentalized nucleus. Um, eukaryote cells are more specialized, and that's part of the complexity of the parasitic diseases because we talk about organisms that um, can can be multicellular. Um, in, we've got you know parasitic worms, for example, when people get intestinal um, parasites. These are multicellular organisms. They, they can be very complex in terms of biology. So, and that's in, important for us to keep in mind because you know I guess the edge certainly of, of the research that we do in the lab, we always have you know the project that we investigate and what we develop aim to find um, therapeutic drugs for these parasitic diseases so when you have organisms that are very complex well it means that you know it might be a little bit harder to find drugs to 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 kill them in a way um right. yeah so uh, what's the focus of your research are you trying to intervene in the parasite while it's in the liver in the red blood cells are you worried about when it spreads to the brain like what, what's your focus well so for the project that we have in the lab that specifically um, look at malaria, we actually focus on the stages of the parasite when they develop inside the red cells. And that is for a number of reasons, I guess. Um, one of them is because it is the stage that causes disease. So um, if we want to find um, new drugs to treat people when they're sick from malaria, then those, one could argue, are the stages that you will need to treat. You need to kill the parasites when they are inside the red cells because that's what's making you sick. Um, the other reason why we do that is because we can actually culture these parasites in the lab. And um, having assays in the lab is extremely important for us to be able to conduct our research. So we often get um, um, human red blood cells from the Australian Red Cross. Um, and these are red cells that are not um, suitable for transfusion and not suitable to go into a hospital setting. So the Australian Red Cross is incredibly um, generous to, to give those cells to research. And in that way, we can have you know, a specialized cell culture lab into which we get these cells and we can propagate our parasites. So we can test drugs, for example, um, in vitro. Um, and as opposed to what you were saying about the liver stages, although they're extremely interesting, they're very difficult. You cannot have a human liver in the lab. There are other ways to do it and people use animal models, but we really focus on the red blood cell stages. Um, and we really want to understand how this parasite causes disease. Um, and we have you know, a few projects um, based on drug screening, for example. We, we're also very interested um, in something you alluded to before, um, how does it cause disease? So um, we are trying to develop some projects where we are starting to look at the link, for example, of perhaps the microbiome in cerebral malaria. That's something that has been a little bit in the scientific field in the last few years. Um, and we're also interested in, in trying to identify the mechanisms that cause anemia. Um, I mentioned before that um, a lot of people die from anemia when they have severe malaria. Um, and we know now today that interesting enough, um, the, the red blood cells that are infected by the parasite, they get um, destroyed and, and, and that is part of the anemia. But we've also found out that a lot of the red blood cells that are not infected with the parasite, they also die. And that is quite an interesting problem that we're trying to look at. Why would a cell that it's not infected by the parasite would die? And that actually is one of the main causes of anemia. You have this massive destruction of red cells. They're not infected by the parasite. Well, how do you know that a, a cell is infected by the parasite? Like how can, large are these parasites? How easy is it to tell? Well, actually, you can really see it relatively well under the microscope because what happens is that as the parasite the parasite gets in your red cells because, again, it needs food. And, and one of the things, you know, like most parasites do, they need food to grow. And as it turns out with malaria parasites, what the food that they need is um, one of the main things you find inside red cells. It's hemoglobin. Um, oh. Hemoglobin is very important for our red cells to transport oxygen in the body. And it turns out that malaria parasites have found a way to feed themselves onto hemoglobin. So actually, they are very tiny when they um, invade a red cell to start with. But in a matter of a day, they will start eating away the hemoglobin. And not only because they need that food for themselves, but also to make space. So in two days time, a malaria parasite will actually become as big as the red cell itself. So you can actually okay, see that. It, wait, all right, one second here. So when malaria, when, it, when a mosquito first feeds on a person, mm -hmm. um, it's actually eating the blood of the person 
or is it preferentially eating the hemoglobin in the blood of the person? The, the thought just occurred to me, that's why. So the mosquito needs the blood of the person. Um, okay, so it's eating whole blood, but the parasite itself now, it's funny in a way, it's repeating and it's eating blood, but just a part of it, just the hemoglobin. It, it, that's right, just the red blood cells, exactly, yeah. Well, not even the whole cell, but just the hemoglobin within the cell? Like, does it, it deplete, so it depletes a red blood cell of hemoglobin, and then the cell dies because of that? Um, well, actually, the, yes, yes, the, the cell will die uh, because of that. And what happens is that the parasite actually will need to pop out of the cell. So it, it uses the host cell for two purposes to eat the hemoglobin and that's its energy if you wish it kind of breaks down the hemoglobin for its own metabolic needs but it also needs to divide itself so a malaria parasite inside the red blood cell will keep dividing and it, it, from one parasite it makes itself again you know like cloning i suppose it's just multiple division cellular division from one parasite that has invaded a cell it will become something between 16 to 32 new parasites and this is the enormous rate of the multiplication of these parasites that we see. So after this 48 hours period between one parasite has entered a red cell and it transforms itself, divides itself into, let's say, another new 32, all of a sudden now you have 32 small new parasites packed inside that red cell and it will pop out. Literally, the red cell will pop out and 32 new parasites will come out. They will stay in the blood. In the blood and they will reinvade new red blood cells. And that's how the infection continues over and over again. So the malaria parasite will first divide and then the parasites will grow in size? Because you, you know, at first you said it grows in size, but does it yep. do these two things in order or does it do one preferentially ever? Or is it, you know, like- It, it actually it's, it's does- just get granular, you know? Yeah, it's actually a, a really great question. It does that in order. So first of all, it grows for the first 24 hours. And then there's a very specific signal that will start the cell division phase. For the next 24 hours, it will divide again and again and again. So basically from one big parasite, it will actually um, do this cell division over and over again. And it will generate a multitude of new small parasites inside itself. So it's, it's not a random mechanism. It's actually a very processed mechanism. And it has to do this sequentially. Um, eating away its hemoglobin, growing, making space for itself inside the cell, and then divide. And after those two cycles have been completed, um, in humans with the, the most um, virulent human parasite of malaria um, that we study in the lab, this process takes 48 hours. And after 48 hours, new parasites come out of the cell. Hmm. Hmm. Interesting. Um so you can tell that the uh, the parasite's eating the hemoglobin preferentially. I mean, what else does it use for its metabolism? Is it, I guess it would be anaerobic or is it uh, aerobic because it's not only eating the hemoglobin, but it's eating the, uh, you know, the oxygen that's attached to it? Mm, well, it actually primarily uses, um, uh, as we said, yes, hemoglobin and a number of other things that are inside the red cells. Um, there's still, it doesn't use the oxygen um, for, for its living. It actually has its own metabolic process. What we do know is actually the parasites need a lot of things that are inside the red blood cell, enzymes, um, metabolites. Um, and that's actually one of the angles that we're very interested in because we would like, so one of the problems with malaria is that um, you know, we have treatments to treat malaria, but with a lot of infections and, you know, the, biggest analogy that you could think of is antibiotic resistance. Now, everyone has heard about antibiotic resistance and we have more and more infections that um, can't necessarily be treated with standard antibiotics because the bacteria has become resistant to the antibiotics that we have. Around the world, it's the same thing for malaria, that uh, a lot of the treatments that we have, we have found that the parasite is becoming resistant to those treatments. So there's this idea that, you know, um, there are already actually parasites that have been identified that are resistant to all of the drugs that we have. So we kind of really need to find new ways to treat malaria because in recent years, we've been pretty good at trying to um, fight this disease. And, and a lot of countries have taken actions to sort of stop the transmission and, and increase the screening. And we've had, um, a, a, you know, particularly one class of good drugs, but we're sort of running out of options because the parasite, again, is catching up on the drugs that we have. So 
in the lab, we have this idea that um, if we want to try and develop new drugs um, fast, perhaps we can actually repurpose drugs that have already been developed. And so one of the ways that we like to think about this is, and this is why we, we like so much and we're so interested in host parasite interactions, is if you think about a parasite like we've just talked about the malaria parasite being inside the red cell and needing so many things of this red cell, well, perhaps if you could target with a drug something that the parasite needs, not inside itself, but outside in the cell where it is, that might be a good strategy to prevent the parasite from getting something that it needs and therefore preventing it from growing or from dividing. So if the parasite, for argument's sake, I'll talk about hemoglobin because it's something that it's easy to, to, to visualize, I guess. If you could prevent the parasite from eating hemoglobin, then all of a sudden it can't grow, right? So if you can prevent... Yep. If you like this podcast, please click the link in the description to subscribe and review us on iTunes. I've got a couple couple more questions. Um, I sure. don't know if you could observe this. So when when malaria first enters a red blood cell, you know the red blood cell is still going through. I would guess the cycle of becoming oxygenated and then deoxygenated. Does the yeah. malaria parasite stop that immediately, or if not, does it act differently when the um, the cell is in a in a uh, saturated oxygen state versus a depleted state? That's a really good question, actually. I'm not sure I have the full answer to that, uh, specifically about the oxygenation. Um, we know that the malaria parasite modifies the red blood cell to an extreme. So um, after it has invaded the red cell, it will start actually um, exporting its own proteins to the red cell, meaning that it's actually going to make itself its own home. So the parasite doesn't stay contained where it is, but it will actually target the red cell, will actually take a lot of its own proteins into the red cell itself into the surface of the red cell itself to really um, transform the red cell into something that it's more advantageous to itself. For example, it will export proteins to the surface of the red cell. And those proteins are gonna be very important because it will make the red blood cell sticky. So an infected red blood cell by a malaria parasite that has all these parasite proteins on the surface, it's gonna become sticky and it's gonna be adhering to, let's say the capillaries um, or the, to the, to the walls of, of the blood capillaries. And the function of that actually, the parasite is, is really quite advantage because it will delay the fact or, or, or even stop the fact that these cells are gonna be eliminated, you know? Um, so it, it will um, have the advantage of keeping the parasite in the cells, in the blood, and then be able to continue to develop. Whatever, if they are eliminated by the spleen, which is kind of the filter of our blood, then the parasite sort of dies. Um, so, um, I don't know exactly about the oxygenation state, and that's a really good question. Interesting um, that, you know, if there's a difference in there, what we do know is that the parasite dramatically modifies its host cell to its own advantage. Yeah. Um, sure. I wonder if it preferentially affects, um, you know, if it, if it, once it's in the blood, if it seeks out again, preferentially the, uh, the red blood cells that are already oxygenated, because you said it arrests the, um, the cell from experiencing cell death. So maybe it also wants to, you know, latch onto a juicy cell, one that's oxygenated and one that's not de de deoxygenated. So it can get yeah. everything it can get, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Potentially. We, well, we do know that certain types of certain species of parasites have a preference for young red cells versus old red cells. So uh, uh, Plasmodium falciparum, which is the, the parasite that really is responsible for all the deaths of malaria, um, doesn't seem to have a, a, a huge preference. It can invade red, young red cells as well as mature red blood cells, but other parasites are a little bit more picky. Um, and, and again, it's something that we don't fully understand. We think that it might have to do something with the surface of the red cells. You know, the maturation of the red cells is a very complex process. And in fact, before they reach this maturation stage where the um, key element of transporting oxygen in the blood, um, in a few days or weeks before that process, they actually even have a nucleus, for example. And, and some parasites are able to invade cells that at, at early stages where they still have a nucleus, where others can't. Um, but we haven't really quite figured out why that is. And it's something that's a bit tricky to... Um, trickier I'd say to investigate in the lab because often 
you have only the mature red blood cells when, when we have these cells from this red blood cross. Very interesting to try and, and figure that out, actually. Yeah. Hmm. Mm. <laughs> I'm just thinking as I go. Um, so you said other red blood cells will die that appear to be unaffected by the, um, you know, by the parasite? Yes. Yeah. And that is something that we find fascinating in the lab. So a few years ago, um, when I was doing a postdoc before doing at La Trobe, I was very fortunate to, to work in a project with a, someone who became a great collaborator of mine. We were both doing a postdoc at the same time, and um, we ended up actually demonstrating for the first time that um, malaria parasites can communicate with each other. And so this has been something in the last few years that's been pretty amazing in the scientific field that we've actually been able to uncover that parasites well, very much like you and I are doing now, we're communicating through words, parasites that are inside, um, let's say, two different red blood cells in the body, they also can communicate among each other. And, and it's something that's been demonstrated for now a number of pathogens um, and a number of parasites. So the way that they do that is actually they package information inside small vesicles. And we know that they can pack a lot of information inside these vesicles we call extracellular vesicles because they are outside of the oh, cell. Okay. Okay. And they can pack DNA or RNA, proteins, metabolites. So we um, think that these vesicles have something to do with the fact that perhaps a red blood cell that is infected with a malaria parasite can send this information out and that will actually do something to the cells that are not infected with the malaria parasites and that might cause them to die. Um, whether it's vesicles, whether it's not vesicles, it's something else, that is something that we're still um, investigating at the moment. What we do know for sure, and we've um, shown this in the lab, is that if you do have parasites um, inside a cell, and if you are able to um, just extract those extracellular vesicles, you put them onto these uninfected cells, and those uninfected cells are gonna uh, predominantly die. Um, even though they haven't been in contact with a parasite. So we know that these, the parasites are signaling things to the outside and that's causing um, the cells to die. So we're very keen on, on identifying exactly how that happens, um, what is the parasite sending, um, because ultimately we think that you know, if we could um, put our finger on what exactly is the parasite sending as a signal, could we use that as a drug target? Could we try and use that, that knowledge to sort of generate a treatment that would prevent the red blood cells that are not infected from dying. And, and potentially that would be extremely useful in the cases of severe anemia, because you want to avoid that massive destruction of red cells, um, which, which is lethal. Do um, red blood cells normally put out EVs? They do, actually. They, they do. Okay. All our cells in our body, actually, they, they secrete EVs. And so um, the, the parasite can take an opportunistic um, way of, of actually using those EVs and packing its own information in there, or it might actually be putting out its own EVs. And it seems that it could potentially be a combination of both, but we do know that um, red cells also have those EVs. So um, that, that is something that we systematically have to do in parallel, where you're sort of going to be testing the EVs from red cells that have never seen a parasite versus the EVs that coming from cells that have parasites inside. And that's how you do the comparison, right? And, and you can ascertain a, a, a mechanism or something that comes just from the EVs, from the parasites. Wait, okay. So the red blood cells normally put out EVs. So are you comparing the EV profile, if you even could, of a red blood cell that's infected versus uninfected? Absolutely. That's exactly what we're doing. Absolutely. So we can... Yeah, how do you do that? I heard that's hard to do. How do you do that? Yes, it's very tricky, actually. Uh, but... Um, well, again, we've got a great collaboration with one of my main collaborators who um, I did a, a postdoc here and now um, she's originally from Israel, so she's back in Israel. And um, we, uh, I've sent one of my students to her lab um, last year to um, work with them for a couple of months. And um, there's, there's really, you do that by ultracentrifugation. It's really quite a complex procedure, but you are able to, from these cells in culture, um, sort of, really um, purify um, a fraction of the media because these cells are outside of, sorry, these vesicles are outside of the cells. So you can actually just precipitate that, those fractions that have the EVs and then 
You can measure this, their size, for example, and we've been comparing the size of the EVs from the infected cells versus the uninfected cells, and they seem to have a slightly different profile. And then you can also study the inside of um, the contents of these EVs. So you can do proteomics, for example, and look at, at all the proteins that are present in these EVs um, from the uninfected and the infected cells. Um, and you start to look at that. You could look at the lipids, you can look at the DNA, you can look at the RNA and start to have an idea of the profile of these EVs. Um, and, then, and then identifying, you know, maybe some interesting candidates um, of proteins, for example, that can be there and that, that they might be the ones that then go on to the non-infected cells and, and cause disease and cause them to um, die prematurely, which is what we're trying to do. So do you, do you think that, I mean, can you tell if, you know, so I have an infected red blood cell, can you tell if the EVs are coming from the parasite or if the parasite is instructing the red blood cell to modify its EVs? Is it using any cellular machinery? You know, does the parasite sit right up against the membrane of the red blood cell and it's literally putting out its own EVs or again, it's using the red blood cell to do it? Yeah, that's such a great question. Uh, I wish I would have an answer to give you. Um, I, at the moment, um, it, is, it is quite difficult to actually make that separation. So we are really just looking at the contents of all the EVs that we can purify. Um, and then what we can do is, is, as I was saying before, you can just really compare the contents. And of course, one of the things that you would see are all the parasite, let's say proteins or lipid, or maybe not lipids, but the proteins definitely, or DNA um, that are from parasite origin that are inside these EVs whether or not the EVs come from the inside of the parasite or it's an EV that was produced by the red cell and the parasite is just packing it with its own material, it is something that we cannot tell at the moment. That, that's why we just, you know, we can look at the contents, we can look at the sizes, we can see the differences, um, but we haven't been able to really make the distinction of the origin. And I, ultimately, it's not, you know, for what we want to do at the moment, it's okay. It's not something that we would, I guess, need absolutely to know, but it's an excellent question and it would be great to be able to make that difference. You said that um, when a red blood cell gets infected, it becomes sticky and how soon does that happen? And then do other red blood cells get attracted and are clots formed of infected red blood cells or is it a mixture you know, in preferential sites? Absolutely. And that is such a, a, a great question. It's really one of the um, main underlying um, causes for the disease. So um, the cells become sticky relatively rapid because you know, the parasites only live for 48 hours inside these cells. And so they really need to, to put these you know, sticky proteins out there sort of within those 24 hours of the first development. And what will happen is actually there is a, a mechanism called rosetting that will cause these cells that are infected not only to become sticky by itself, but they can also become surrounded by other uninfected cells. And in fact, when this happens in the capillaries in the brain, that's exactly what's going to cause clotting. And so these capillaries are going to become obstructed with a lot of red cells that are packed against each other. So you might have one infected cell in the middle that is surrounded by four or five of other non-infected cells. That's going to cause a clot. Um, oxygenation of the brain will become a problem and that's ultimately the cause of coma. Um, so um, a lot of young kids who suffer from malaria in this case of, you know, in the case of a clinical case of cerebral malaria, once the lack of oxygenation and clotting of the capillaries in the brain happens, it's very difficult to revert. They, they go into a coma and then eventually they'll die. Um, we, we don't have a way to sort of come back from that. Um, and, and that's really one of the problems of the disease. Yeah. So the, the so the sticky infected red blood cells are sticky to the epithelial cells and to other red blood cells. Yes, absolutely. They can they they can do both. They can cause this clotting with lots of other cells around, uh, and they can then also stick to the capillaries itself um, to avoid being eliminated by the spleen. So it's a combination so, of. So, so have you looked at like what happens when when a red cell bur when a red cell is now stick stuck and sitting there and it has other cells around it? and the parasite goes through its cycle and bursts out, do you think that it, the stickiness helps in accumulating more food for that parasite? Like, do the, um, the burst parasite progeny now preferentially enter the cells that are adjacent to feed off their hemoglobin? And this has acted as like a food net to get a bunch more food close together? 
Yeah, that's such a great idea, actually. Look, I, I, I don't know the answer to that. So, I mean, remember, most of it is in the, in, in the blood flow. So um, parasites in, in the cells are really dynamic. If it wasn't for the stickiness to, being a, a, to avoid to being eliminated, the parasites might be flowing at those early stages, you know, quite fast. Our, our blood travels quite fast in our own veins. Whether or not it can attract and it be a food net for, for the new parasites, maybe, maybe. If, if they are very close, then they have obviously a possibility to reinvade new red cells. Um, that, that, that could be one of, one of the reasons. Um, as I said, we, there's a lot that we don't understand in, in this pathophysiology, if you want, of the cerebral malaria. Why does it happen? How does it happen? There's a lot of open questions in, in this area. Um, we, what, we, what we can do at the moment in the uninfected cells, we can look at what we call the phenotype. So, you know, uh, something that's been really described for, for a lot of our cells in the body, it's the mechanism of death. So we call that the uh, apoptosis mechanism. We know how a cell dies and, and in our body, all our cells have a, a lifetime in a way. Um, they, they leave, they develop, they, they multiply and eventually they'll die. And, and, and there's a, an, a number of mechanisms of cell death. The apoptosis is probably the most well-known um, what we do know is that red cells, and this has been sort of put out in the literature in the, in the recent years, even though they are unique cells the, because they don't have a nucleus and, and apoptosis very much relies on, on a nucleus, we also know that red cells have a form of programmed cell death. And, and it's something that's been trying to be investigated in recent years. We call that eryptosis as, as opposed to apoptosis because it comes from erythrocytes, from red cells. So eryptosis is, is the form of um, program cell death of erythrocytes. So one of the aspects that we have in the lab is that we can measure when a cell is sort of dying and it's in this eryptotic stage or it's a healthy cell. Um, and, and that's one of the ways that we measure the viability of red cells. So we can do assays and we can you know, do all these tests with parasites and with the EVs and, and, and that's how we kind of, um, we can measure the lifetime of these red cells. And, and we know that the Red cells, as I was saying before, in the presence of EVs and parasites, they, they have this accelerated death. And we think that's one of the reasons why, you know, that leads to anemia. Um, whether or not they sort of have an increased food and they, they can be um, more prone to be invaded, that's something that it's also under investigation. But it's certainly we know that the parasite, even though it's inside one cell, is able to communicate and to do a lot of things to the other cells that are surrounding. Um, so, you know, Probing them to be invaded, that's obviously, you know, a good question. And, and it's quite a, an important one that it might lead to its own advantage, right? Because a parasite wants to invade more cells and keep replicating. That's how it survives. So, so there's a, a lot of mechanisms that we are trying to uncover what the parasite does to the other cells. Um, and again, because we have this therapeutic or the drug discovery behind, once we understand the biology, then we can sort of think about how can we develop a drug that would prevent that from happening. Well, it seems like you can modulate the uh, red blood cell environment quite a bit. I mean, you know, what if you, um, if someone got affected with malaria and you, you right away put them in a hyperbaric oxygen environment, did treatments, you know, a bunch of them in the first 24, 48 hours or in the first week, you know, you'd create an environment where the red blood cells would either, uh, I don't know, they would probably be affected quite a bit. Oxygen saturation would change and use of hemoglobin would change. And I wonder how that it, that would change the parasite's behavior. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's really, that, that's, I, I was just trying to picture actually that <laughs> image that you just described. Yeah, I mean, for sure, we can definitely um, try and, you know, manipulate, I guess, our own cells. Um, I, I don't know about the applicability of something that you've just described um, in the field. I mean, keeping in mind that, you know, most of the countries actually that are endemic from malaria are found in, in Africa, in Southeast Asia, in, in South America. These are tropical regions. So that, you know, w what you were just putting out there as a scenario, it's something that would be interesting to investigate in the lab. But at the same time, you kind of have to think of a strategy that would be applicable um, at a low cost in, in tropical regions of the globe. So when I was talking about drugs before, and one of the ideas so um, that we'd like to explore in the lab and um, currently we're doing, is alongside this idea of looking at the red cell itself and what is the parasite needing from the red cell. Um, the reason behind that is because if you think about it, the red cell has a lot of things that proteins, for example, that are probably have already been targeted with drugs to cure human diseases. 
So if you think of targeting something from our own cells, immediately that offers the opportunity to repurpose drugs that have been developed for other human diseases. So all of a sudden, you're hitting two main advantages in there. First of all, we really like to explore these ideas that is there something on the shelf that has been developed for another human disease that we could repurpose to treat malaria? So it ticks box number one because it's a drug that has already been developed. And if it has been developed, then it means that, you know, somehow it has some approvals in terms of toxicity, in terms of efficacy, in terms of use for um, human diseases, which is really quite important. So we're not talking about something that is kind of, you know, 10, 15, 20 years away from being used in the clinic. It's already in the clinic. So it's, it's there. We could reuse it. And in, in mind, we've got a few projects, for example, trying to use anti-cancer drugs because we have targets that we think could be important um, and reutilized to treat malaria. What about, uh, you know, like, I understand drugs are important, but, you know, the reason why I mentioned like the hyperbaric oxygen, it's not necessarily a drug. You know, what about people that uh, bleed a lot or people that clot a lot? You know, yeah. have they been looked at? What's the phenotype look like if malaria infects those two kinds of people? You know, what if you give someone, uh, you know, vasodilators or uh, anti-clotting drugs or clotting drugs? Does that hasten or slow the malaria? Because maybe now the stickiness of the red blood cells is less and or the vessels are bigger and therefore they don't get trapped as much. I mean, yeah. I guess there's other interventions that could be done. And even if they're not available, let's say in Africa or Southeast Asia, they may shed light on what would work and why. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we know that um, a, a lot of people in around the world, actually, in a number of labs are looking at... Um, the relationship between the capillaries and the rigidity of these cells. And so you, there's thing, things you can do in the lab, for example, with microchambers where you can do really high-tech microscopy to look exactly at the relationship of these cells within the capillaries, the blood flow. Uh, we know that these cells become a lot more rigid. So, so sure, you know, that, that would be something that could be um, tested. It's, it's not something that we work on, um, but I guess an interesting area to look at. Um, I, I guess what we're trying to do is really to look at the inside of the parasite in the cell, um, but we haven't we don't we haven't really addressed questions a, around the capillaries, for example. It's probably a little bit more of a medical relevant area, but uh, but of, of, of course you know there's um, lots of we have to consider the, the the disease itself. In case of anemia, for example, using drugs that will sort of you know help in in that sense would certainly be a valuable avenue, I suppose. Yeah. What what happens to the um someone that's infected by malaria do they, you know do they ever get bitten by a naive mosquito and then it goes back round again like absolutely malaria you know are we the end of the road for malaria no absolutely that's exactly um how the parasite continues to develop in fact um it can't be the end of the road because then the 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 infection would stop with one person right so exactly like you said what happens is that we know that Certain parasites, not all of them, but a small proportion of the parasites that are inside the red cells, they're going to somehow change itself. There's a, you know, a genetically programmed um, way or mechanism, I guess, um, that will change these parasites into what we call gametocytes. It's a different form, slightly different form of parasites. And what has to happen then is that once some of these parasites have transformed in se- themselves into gametocytes, a new mosquito has to come along, feed on the person that has a few gametocytes around, you know, circulating in the blood. And while this mosquito is naively taking a blood meal, it will uptake some of these gametocytes inside the blood. And that's exactly how the cycle of the parasite starts again. So it has to go from the person back to a naive mosquito. Um, and, And so what happens is after the mosquito has taken this blood meal, these gametocytes, they're now in the stomach of the mosquito. And at the beginning, we said that the parasites inject sorry the mosquitoes inject the parasites that are in the salivary glands so what has to happen in this new mosquito that just had a blood meal these parasites have to go from the gut of the parasite uh, where they've just been you know sitting and being digested as a nice blood meal and they have to um, develop and transform themselves and migrate to the salivary glands they go through a few processes of transformation and, and and maturation i guess and they transform themselves into different stages so for about a period of two weeks these parasites are going to come out of the gut of the mosquito and they will um, come out outside of the gut. They will migrate into the hemolymph, which is the mosquito blood, and will migrate themselves into new forms. They will then sit in the salivary glands, patiently waiting. And two weeks later, when the mosquito is hungry again, 
and it has to take another blood meal, uh, will find another person to feed. And when that other person is being bitten by the mosquito, there we go, the parasite goes from the salivary glands into this other person and starts a cycle over again and goes mm. to the and then to the blood. So absolutely, those that, that it's a quite a complex cycle that parasites generally have, which is also one of the characteristics of these organisms. They often need it, most of the times they need at least two hosts, sometimes more, to be able to develop. And they have these very complex forms that, you know, sometimes you would think they're completely two different organisms, um, but actually they're just one. So it's the same genetic makeup, but they have to develop, in this case, within the mosquito um, and then within the human host and then back to the mosquito. Um, and it's the same organism that does that cycle over and over again. And that's how the, the malaria parasite propagates itself inside the population from one mosquito to one person, one mosquito into another person, another mosquito, another person. And that's how it gets transmitted. Hmm. I guess if you really want to get crazy, uh, has anyone looked at the microbiome of the parasite itself? Well, not the microbiome of the, the, the parasite, but... Um, what if it has one? Um, well, actually, interesting enough, well, yes, that's, you know, something that we can definitely look, you know, people keep exploring, actually, what's inside the parasite. And interesting enough, there was a very interesting story earlier this year, not, not from us, but from a, a lab, including people in Sydney, in Australia. It was fascinating. You know, I've been, myself and many others, of course, for many years, have been thinking, what about virus? What about, you know, virus inside these parasites? And actually, surely enough, someone has put a paper out there where they've looked at the genetic makeup of the parasites and they think they have found a viral signature. And I love this story because they've called it the Marioska virus. You know, those uh, Russian dolls, they are sort mm -hmm. of- no, the Matryoshka, yeah. Ex exactly. So there's, there's one and then another one inside, another one inside. And, and so the reason why they gave this name to this virus is because it's basically a cell that has a parasite inside and it has a virus inside. So it has those sort of three layer component, which I thought it was a brilliant idea. So, you know, uh, this has been um, possible in recent years because of the, the massive development of sequencing techniques and allows us to do amazing things today. So I'm, I'm sure that in the years to come, we'll be able to, um, you know, probe more the genome of these parasites. And um, I don't really know if they would have a microbiome. We haven't really, but you know, who knows? Who knows what we might be able to, to find out. Um, there are people looking at the microbiome of mosquitoes, for example, and how that um, mm -hmm. you know, changes the interaction with the parasite and the ability for the mosquito to be infected with the parasite. And that's a very interesting area. Um, so certainly, you know, it's one of the fascinating uh, ideas about host parasite interaction is that all of a sudden you're studying not one organism, but possibly many others that this parasite interacts with. And, and what does it mean for the disease? Um, so that's, you know, I, I think a, a great avenue of research for the years to come. Well, how many, how many cells is the parasite composed of approximately? Well, so in, in the, in, in the red blood cell, um, as I was saying, it can multiply and divide into two. Um, I mean, but each, each parasite, is it once one eukaryotic cell or is it multi? Yes, it is. Yes. Each parasite is one eukaryotic cell. Yes. Okay. Okay. Hmm. It's so quite yeah, a, a it, complex, it's, uh, but yeah, one. It may have a microbiome, it may not, but it, it certainly probably has viruses that prey upon it, you know, so. Yeah, yeah. Hmm. These organisms Crazy. have been infecting humans for, you know, millennia. So I think um, we, still, we still have a lot of questions to learn, which is the fascinating side of biology is that you, you find something and then, you know, you think you've answered a question and then you have 10 more questions and, and definitely one of the, drives of science uh, with, you know, the evolution of new techniques in the lab and the possibilities of things that we can do, you know, metabolomics and proteomics, phosphoproteomics or sequencing techniques, um, you know, use of, of animal models. And so there's just so much development all the time that we're sort of pushing the boundaries of our knowledge and, and the kind of things that we can investigate and the questions that we might be able to answer. Um, I, I, I quite believe that the, this interaction and learning more about the interaction of the parasite with its own cells will be, or is actually an area that will be able to allow us not only to, to, to really, um, you know, make big steps forward in terms of biology and the basic science, but I think we'll be able to learn a lot from it to be able to cure people who are sick from malaria and, and redesign drugs by learning more about potentially 
new drug targets that we haven't seen before, that we haven't been able to discover before. And that, that's really, you know, the, the part that we get fascinated by. Are there any, uh, you know, do rats or mice get infected with malaria or are there any other animals that can be used as an animal model? Yeah, oh, absolutely. There's, there's dozens of malaria parasites. You know, malaria parasites can infect almost anything. They can, they, they can infect chicken of the malaria parasites. They're often specific of their hosts. So, you know, a, a plasmodium parasite that infects a chicken, for example, cannot infect a human. Um, but there are definitely rodent malaria parasites and they are actually very useful. Um, I did my PhD uh, using a mouse model um, because you can, you know, how we're talking about the cycle before and how complex it is. Um, I, I did my PhD at the Pasteur Institute in, in Paris in, in France and um, it was a tremendous place to be working because we had an insectarium, so we were breeding mosquitoes, and then we also had mice, and we had this rodent malaria parasite. So we could, in the lab, have access to the full life cycle. And that, you know, for a biologist, is just heaven, because you can basically infect mice um, with the parasites that are coming from the mosquito. Um, so you could actually put the mice asleep and on top of a cage of the mosquito, and the mosquito would, uh, would bite the mice. So that's a, you know, recreating in the lab almost a natural infection so in terms of biology it has enormous advantage and then you can also look at the parasites developing inside the mice and then you're able to again retransmit those parasites that are in the mice um, to new naive mosquitoes and 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 actually look at the parasites that are then in the mosquitoes so i used to um, work with um, parasites that were fluorescent so we would dissect the mosquitoes and we could have a look under the microscope at these beautiful fluorescent parasites. They were in the gut of the mosquitoes. They were in the salivary glands. Um, we could study them. We could see them uh, moving in a cover sleep and, and do microscopy. So um, those those models are extremely, extremely useful. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. So um, what's the best way for people to find out more about your particular take and approach on malaria and get in contact? Well, I guess um, the Latrobe website is is really keeping up to date, um, and I'm I'm very happy to um, you know have anyone emailing me or or asking any questions. Um, always very happy to talk about what we do in the lab. Um, I think we've got very you know interesting projects coming up, and and students who are very excited. Um, we try to do a little bit of outreach activities to sort of people to find out more through the Australian Society for Parasitology, for example. We have National Science Week coming up in August, and there's a, a few outreach activities um, that have been posted through the, the Australian Society for Parasitology website, which is a good way for people to, to know more about what we do. And yeah, very happy to, to get in touch um, using my email um, or just searching my name on the Latrobe website. Well, very good. Teresa, thanks for coming on the podcast. It's been very interesting. Well, thanks for having me, Richard. Lovely to talk to you. If you like this podcast, please click the link in the description to subscribe and review us on iTunes. You've been listening to the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. If you like what you hear, be sure to review and subscribe to the Finding Genius Podcast on iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts. And want to be smarter than everybody else? Become a premium member at FindingGeniusPodcast.com. This podcast is for information only. No advice of any kind is being given. Any action you take or don't take as a result of listening is your sole responsibility. Consult professionals when advice is needed.